friends of the jazz, welcome Kate Mila Kodza here tonight to launch this outstanding publication. When I was preparing for the President's speech, Michael D. O'Higgins and Sabina, I was told I had to whittle my speech down to six minutes, from six minutes to two minutes. Don't worry, I obeyed, and I will not have you endure my six minute speech either tonight. But I do hope that when we have the pleasure of a presidential visit at the Jazz again, to which you will all surely be invited, that maybe you will hear my six minute speech. <laughs> now, it is indeed a great honour and a pleasure to launch this book. This book chronicles very astutely the history of the Jazz, indeed the history of the foundations of Galway City. All I have to do is stroll down the main streets of Galway and look at the Jez family names over the businesses in the city. Jez past pupils have certainly put Galway where it is today. I know that without a doubt. This book is a real testament to the hard work and the dedication of the chairperson of our past pupils union, Mr. Tom Kenny, who will be addressing you shortly. And the proofreaders, Paddy Lydon, Bernie O'Connell, Frank Canavan, and indeed Catherine Hickey, our Deputy Principal, and myself on occasion, deserve a special mention also for the proofreading. It has indeed been a long, long road, and we're so glad to have this book tonight. As educators, I have to say, if we would have our say, and certainly we will try to include this book on the Department of Education History Syllabus. That's where it should be. Such an outstanding a book. Now, uh, I'd like to thank Siobhan for helping me to organise this event and I would like to, sh to also make a very special mention that uh, Father John Humphreys, we'd love to have him with us here today and he really, this was his brainchild, this was his idea and I'm so glad to have worked with him on this project. And without further ado, I will now hand over to um, Sean O'Rourke, our MC for this evening. For Emil Mahogi Guleo. I say first of all, Erin Gledel, she's this book is an absolute treasure trove uh, of memory, of insight, of affection for one of the great educational institutions uh, of the West of Ireland and particularly of this town. <coughs> so, Cogorge um, is more the town Kenny August Marshall Lijon and uh, Fern Galair for bringing it all together. I don't know how many hours I have whiled away turning his pages, uh, reading some of the articles, studying some of those magnificent photographs, um, and I'm not finished yet. Uh, I was reminded early on in his pages that there's a strong tradition of broadcasting in this school. Um, some are mentioned or contributed to the book, um, others one thinks of people like uh, Prunchy Smokanesa, Harry McGee, uh, Sean Dignan, Killian Fennell, Michal Lally, and perhaps most famously or infamously of all, William Joyce, uh, Liam Shoiga, I wonder what he called that when he was here, Lord Ha Ha, better known to the world. <clears throat> and he's there on page 35 in a class picture from sometime around 1918, uh, such a wonderful picture, and his face is full of expression and cockiness and self-assuredness, uh, and he was only 12 or 13. If I had a fraction of it, I would have got a proper job somewhere uh, in, in broadcasting. <laughs> Um, in my case, it's only a slight exaggeration to say that my first broadcast happened when I was still in school. Um, February 1973, there was an election on, and some people in our class took to hanging around the Fine Gael. It happened to be closer, no offence intended, Bobby. Um, the, the Fine Gael headquarters were a few doors away from the school. And on election night, when I should have been at home studying for the Leaving Cert, I happened to go down there, I find myself there, and a call came through at about half seven or eight o'clock from the Labour Party, and there was about an hour of uh, polling left to, 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 to conclude. And they were stuck for somebody to take the microphone in a van, an old minibus, a VW minibus driven by a man uh, called Roach, whose sons, I think, went to the Jazz in another era, one of them a very famous tennis player. So I found myself, yes, Jim, James, uh, being driven around Chantal, telling the good people of Ash Road and O'Connor Road, or O'Connor Road as they call it, um, and Fursey Road to come out and vote for the 14 point plan, to give the number one to Michael D and to give Fintan Coogan and John Mannion their other preferences. Um, it didn't have a great effect, by the way. <laughs> Bobby Malloy was still the top dog. Um, and um, the, uh, the, the thing about it was, there wasn't time to tell that story a few weeks ago when the president was here for the reasons that the, uh, the, the Lord Washter uh, mentioned. Uh, but it is true. For me personally, it's a huge honour to be uh, invited to speak at this launch. Uh, not least because I consider myself 
to have been one of the slowest learners ever to pass through the school. Uh, Kalosh to acknowledge the Jez and I'll explain why in a few minutes. Actually, I wouldn't be here at all uh, were it not for a casual remark passed to my father over a half a century ago when he arrived in Galway to become principal of the Clada Boys School, National School. There were eight children in the family, two of whom were already in boarding school by then, though sometimes gulag, one's tempted to say, might have been a better description. Um, the principal of the Clada Girls School at the time, by the way, was the very formidable Mrs. O'Donoghue, uh, who was uh, then uh, frequently driven to her son, uh, sorry, but to school, by, I should say, by her son, Donna. Um, I think that would be him there on page 95 of this book, uh, alongside Eamon Lynch from a famous family in Devon Park. And he's there again, uh, looking rather pleased with himself on another page, page 97, I think it was, uh, behind a shield full of medals. So uh, I think, Tom, you're guaranteed a load of sales uh, for Donna. He'd be backing up the truck one of these times because he'd want to impress all the grandchildren. Uh, but to come back to, to, to our own family story, the plan was to spread, the, the plan initially was um, that uh, Coveen uh, was to go to uh, St. Mary's and Fran was going for the jazz, and then when, things, when the parents saw how that would work out, the rest of us would be sent wherever. Um, the Bishop Horse was an old go area uh, because um, the Patric Patrician brothers at the time specialised in poaching clever boys from the national schools and luring them to St. Patrick's, a cause for, of, of deep resentment among the INTO members. But anyway, uh, as I said, the plan was to send Kavim to the uh, St. Mary's, but uh, the manager of the Clada, uh, another formidable individual, Father Heenham, made the fatal mistake of telling my father that his lordship, Dr. Brown, expected his teachers to send their children, their sons, to St. Mary's, which of course had precisely the opposite effect to that intended. <laughs> and Coveen was immediately placed in the tender care of the Jesuits, where he remains to this day uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the team working uh, the priests in Gardner Street. Um, there are many fine reminiscences in this anthology. Um, and uh, perhaps the one that gives me most pause for thought is uh, Father Conal Quinn's one. Uh, it's called Visionary Yes, uh, uh, Politician No. And it's about Father Sean O'Connor, who was appointed principal in 1968 in succession to the much loved and respected Father Bob McGordon. I suppose respect came partly from the fact that he uh, had access to the famous leather on latter. Uh, and you could be told, by, as I frequently was, by. Um, uh, teachers write a note for Shave Willie. Uh, Father O'Kelly, I think, was uh, a frequent user of that phrase. Um, and Sean O'Connor wanted to change things. Um, and Connor's piece is insightful, sombre, and hilarious at the same time. The backdrop was the Prague Spring, Vatican II, the Paris Student Revolution. And I just want to quote briefly from it. Um, Sean was a great visionary, but to his cost, he was a poor politician. Like Pierce, it was only after his removal that his vision was solidified into an influential political reality. He had failed to win over four constituencies that needed to be brought aboard if his project of reform was to succeed. These four constituencies were the senior boys, the lay staff, the Jesuit community, and the parents. Well, who else might have been? What other constituencies, one asks? Uh, each group had the capacity to scupper the implementation of the vision and each one helped do exactly that. The senior boys used the sudden elimination of corporal punishment as a license for disruptive behaviour, which initially gave the school a certain, sorry, a certain chaotic appearance, and in his first year, Sean had welcomed a large group of repeat but disgruntled seventh years back to sit the leaving cert. In general, they proved a disruptive force among the senior boys. The taking of the annual school photographs descended into a mini riot <laughs> between fourth and sixth years on the pitch, a spectacle which provided plenty of fodder, fodder for Sean's detractors. And so it goes. Um, it wasn't just the senior boys who cut loose. I was in second year when all of this was going on. And we went straight from the Bob McGorn disciplinarianism to, to what? Well, I suppose fully 15 years before the end of corporal punishment in Irish education. It vanished overnight in this school. And I know we're in a city, but I'm going to make a rural allusion anyway, because lots of guys come in from Mathenry and Spiddle and other places uh, when free education was brought in. It brought a lot of country lads in. And without corporal punishment, we were suddenly like spring calves let loose <laughs> um, in a field. And we went a bit wild, and I think it took 
several years for something approaching order to be restored. In her later years, my, my mother, God rest her, who was a stalwart tea and sandwich maker for uh, Jeremiah's uncle Stefan and other card players on Sunday nights uh, when they were raising money for the new school, uh, she used to reminisce how I usually came home for the dinner in the middle of the day, needless to say, full of stories of classroom antics about hamsters being let loose and the like usually perpetrated by a gang of four who caused a lot of grief to some of the teachers and certainly uh, tested the patience of them all. I didn't do much in second year, I didn't do much in third year, I didn't do much in fourth year. Happily it was possible to take up a new subject or two in fifth year um, and, and sixth year. Um, and what saved me was being able to take up Spanish and, and economics. When my interresults results came out uh, at the end of fourth year, uh, in 1971, I think it was, and this, remember, was the Apollo era uh, of space missions. My father took one look at, uh, with greater respect and affection, and it wasn't your fault, Bernie Darcy. He took one look at my science results, and he said he made a, an observation that became famous in our family folklore. Well, he says it looks like our Sean won't be going to the moon. <laughs> um, um, last October. About one third of my class here got together over a weekend to mark the 40 years that had passed since the Lady Cert. And somebody suggested uh, we do what's known in European political terms at summit meetings as a tour de table where, every, where everybody, we went around the table and everybody said something um, uh, at the dinner. And rather thoughtlessly and I think ungraciously in hindsight, <coughs> and perhaps because I was, this is my excuse, so watched her. Uh, I was preoccupied by the professional adventure on which I had recently embarked upon at that stage. Uh, I suggested that in those years, I had gained more by way of character formation from um, the Jazz Rowing Club than I had in the classroom. And you can read more about that on page 143 um, at Sequitur. And essentially my point that night in October was that such was the chaotic atmosphere in the school uh, that we learned nothing. And as pupils, we spent our time giving cheek, asking smart questions, and trying to catch our teachers out. And it was only later that night as I was driving back to Dublin, uh, somewhere having crossed the Shannon, I realised what an Amadon I had been at dinner earlier. What an absolute plonker. And here's the slow learner bit. Because what is it, on martial Lidge, I might ask, what is it that you spent the last 25 years doing uh, with your life for a living? It's asking questions, and occasionally you might even ask a sensible one. Um, and August Rodella, where did you first learn to ask those questions? Uh, and just occasionally ask a question that might make a small bit of sense, uh, like you might do now from time to time. Well, actually, it was here in the school, uh, in the jazz, in the atmosphere encouraged by Athar Sean O'Kurhor. Perhaps it's no coincidence that one of the teachers who arrived in the jazz at that time, of great upheaval, was none other than my friend and hero, Frank Canavan, who epitomised that spirit of student-teacher engagement uh, in that time. And as I've said before, Frank, you treated, us, you treated us as adults long before we deserved it. And uh, I believe that that spirit endures to this day. Uh, somehow we got through it, and if you look at the picture of our year in our leaving search, you will see lawyers, you will see accountants, you will see solicitors, you'll see a couple of reporters, you'll see teachers, you'll see entrepreneurs. So, you know, what was to worry about during all of that? Uh, happily, most of, this picture, uh, of the teachers in, that, in, in the picture are still alive and well. Mr. Holland, Mr. Ryder, I see over there. Uh, Antara Dulanya, alive and well out in the Iron Islands. Uh, Banny Darcy, uh, and Mr. Canavan. And I don't know just uh, what records exist in the school filing cabinets or in the Jesuit archives. I'm told some of those exchanges were so sensitive they actually were communicated in Latin. Um, uh, but I would love to see a more detailed account uh, of those years of upheaval. Uh, I think it would be very good, uh, and I think there may even be the basis of some academic study in this, to get the reminiscences on tape of those teachers who are still alive and remember those years. Though I suppose after the experience of Boston College in recent times, maybe that might be such a good, <laughs> such a good idea after all. Who knows? Uh, but I really do believe that the record should be gathered. Um, anyone arriving in this school in 2014 would have to say that it looks to have a far brighter future than looked possible in the, in the mid-70s. Not just the buildings and the, and, and the beautiful classrooms, the co-educational dimension. Um, you may not have as many, or you may have very few Jesuits around, 
to, to help with that. But there's a huge effort being made by the teachers, the lay staff. And you've also got a resource now uh, that wasn't there before. You've got Pope Francis to draw on with all of his inspiration. One of the most fascinating individuals on this planet uh, uh, as we speak. And as for character formation, well, it still happens. As, uh, I was invited here almost a year ago to the day, and just before the, May, the Maybank holiday weekend, to give a talk and a few reminiscences. And it was the very last event held in the um, Griffin building before it was renovated. And we were up in the old library, and the place was sort of rather lonely and unloved looking and, and drab. And what a wonderful job they've done over there since, as well as here. And the place had been cleared. And you wondered walking through it if demolition rather than renovation might have been a better idea. Um, and the Vice Principal Catherine told me about a little incident earlier in the day when a person or persons, I can't remember, had been caught leaving graffiti on a wall. And you might be thinking, oh, well, look, the school is closed and you know, sort of nothing else to do. Uh, you know, and you might say, well, you know, let them off with a severe warning about, um, you know, as to future conduct. But what did she say? Did she say, looking for you, the building is closing this weekend? If I catch you doing it in the new place, woe be tied to it. No, she didn't. She said, uh, you're going to clean it up now. And it was cleaned up then. So, you know, if you're worried about character formation, it's still going on around here. Uh, it's a wonderful book. And uh, thank you very much for having me. And I really enjoy it. And so will you. Buy more than one copy if you've got friends who in the chest. <laughs> and informative talk. It was absolutely outstanding. And it is now indeed my honour and privilege to welcome Mr. Tom Kenny, who happens to be the grandfather of the 26th member of the Kenny family attend, to attend this school, and also the president of the Past Pupils Union, Mr. Tom Kenny. Well, I Reverend Fathers and Jez Heads, although they weren't called Jez Heads in my day, we were known as Jez Mugs. That is as opposed to Fish Gogs. Uh, this book is not really a history, actually. It was a labour of love, I have to say, which meant a lot of labour and a lot of love too. <clears throat> it, it's really a lot of reminiscences. It's the school as seen through different eyes and different generations and different media. Some might be involved with rugby or rowing or debating or mountaineering or whatever. And it's a kind of a record of change, really, I suppose. Uh, it's, it's a record of how the school has changed very considerably into the quite remarkable campus that it is today. In my time in the 50s here, the numbers were very low. <clears throat> Our leaving cert class, we were 10. So obviously, we always had difficulty, as had classes before us. It began to change after our time, but the classes before us and us, we had great difficulty in getting teens together. We just simply didn't have the numbers, and so we ended up with small little fellas that came up to our elbows playing on teams with us as lots of guys around here can testify. <clears throat> uh, but in putting this book together, in working on this project, I was absolutely blessed, I have to say, with what I can describe as the Jazz A team. And these were the contributors, past pupils, staff, <coughs> all kinds of people from across the board who <coughs> contributed to the book in many different ways. The captain of that team, without doubt, was Heavy Lighten or on Marsh or religion. I, he sat in the same class as me for years and I can't get used to this Marsh or religion stuff. But I want, Harry was absolutely wonderful. He said, look, the person you need to go to about this is so-and-so, and I'll take that photograph. I know who will get me the names for this and so on. He was absolutely wonderful, a tower of strength. But so also, I have to say thank you to all of the contributors, to those who wrote articles, to those who gave it old photographs, to those who named people in the photographs, which was very critical. Uh, <clears throat> and a special thanks, I have to say, go to Mary and to Catherine, the 
principal and vice principal. Because they were, this was all being done through a very difficult time, major building project going on and so on. But they always made time for me, I have to say, and I very much appreciate it. And also, the same goes for the staff, the, the staff, Joan and Lorraine and uh, <coughs> Irene. Now, a lot of the comment that I've heard so far about the book has been about the quality of the production. And that is all due to this lady over here with this very gorgeous red dress, Paula Nolan, who designed the book and put it all together. She took the jumble of articles and photographs and news clippings, etc., that I gave her, and she converted it into what I think is genuinely a kind of work of art. And this was enhanced even more so by our local printers, Castle Print, who did a superb job, I have to say, in printing the book. The idea for the book came from John Humphreys, uh, who sadly is ill at the moment, uh, but he is very much in our prayers and he's very much part of this book. <coughs> now, when I came here in the 1950s, <coughs> I came into the world of, and this is for some of the older people in the building. <clears throat> uh, people like Flourishing and Spitz and Bubbles and Fatty and Lipper and one who rejoiced in the name of Beetle Bumble. No. <laughs> and they were all Jesuits, by the way. <laughs> uh, the school was all Irish. It was an A school. We only were allowed to speak in Irish. We could play Gaelic football or hurling or rowing. There was very little cultural input, really, genuinely. There was the kind of annual play, which was one night in the year. Uh, there was a very occasional debate, but I think that probably the highlights for us uh, in a cultural sense was when we'd be given classes free and we'd be sent up to the Savoy to watch uh, the Ten Commandments, or <laughs> Misha Air or something like that. <clears throat> but having said all of that, I mean, this seems like light years ago in one way, and it seems like only a very short time ago in another way. We were given the benefit of a remarkably rounded and wonderful education, as Sean and Mary have said. And the school since has gone through all kinds of changes, and remarkable changes, really. No corporate punishment, you know, co-education, new buildings, a dedicated national school, uh, extracurricular activities that we couldn't have dreamt of in our days. Subjects that we couldn't do. Technical graphics. I mean, God, the idea of computer screens in our days. Anyway, a lot of this change is recorded in the, um, in the book, I hope. Uh, <clears throat> like the facilities, that the, the building that we're in, beyond our wildest dreams, really. I, I think walking through this school during school time is more like a kind of a, a third level campus almost. There's a terrific atmosphere. You know, the old. Jesuit cliche of give me the boy and I'll give you the man. That's still there. And the other constant that's still there from the days of Spitz and Bubbles and all those guys <clears throat> is the kind of remarkable spirit and energy that's in the school. It may not be unique to this school, but it's very tangible as you walk through the school. Uh, and I think it's, it's literally quite wonderful. <clears throat> and long may it stay there. It's, it's quite remarkable when I think of the fact that we couldn't get teams together and the National School on the other side of Rally Row has at least twice, maybe three times the number of pupils that we had when we were here, which included the Bond School and the Senior School. So the book, as I say, has been a real work and labor of love. Uh, one of the great things that has happened as a result is that in compiling and gathering the material together, it gradually evolved into what is becoming a serious archive. In terms of photographs, in terms of just reminiscences of stories, uh, press clippings, different kinds of things that people have contributed. And I think we owe this to the future generations that are going to come through this school. Uh, <clears throat> the website has been remarkably transformed in the last few years. The transition years now will include every year an archive committee and their job is to archive events as they happen on a daily basis in the school. 
so-and-so won this debating competition, so-and-so got second in this rowing race, etc., etc. But also to work retrospectively, to go back, to gather retrospective material, be it photographic or in manuscript or type form or book form, whatever kind of form. And I think this is critically important. There is going to be a dedicated archive room in this school. So I would like to appeal to all past pupils, if you happen to have photographs, or newspaper <laughs> articles, or any, any kind of documentation, even just stories like Sean's about your time in the school, then could you please send them to the school? The website is there, the email, it's all in the book. And, uh, and build up and make much more accessible, uh, far more <coughs> archive, I think, because I think it's, we owe it to future generations to show them the value of the heritage, the history, and the great tradition that is Kalashta Ignite. Kormil Mahavi. Also, we have uh, some of the photos from the digital archive and some current photos on display in this study area in here, which is also known as the lecture theatre. And please take your time and have a look at what's on display there. Please keep an eye on www.colorstoignite.ie. Click on the Past Pupils tab to see more of the digital archive. It is absolutely outstanding, but we need as much as you can give us to get that digital archive up to where we want it to be. If you have anything, like Tom said earlier, in your attic, under the bed, or anywhere at all, please forward them to us and we will scan them and we will look after them and we will definitely be returning them to you in the condition that we got them. Don't worry, all will not be lost. <coughs> I hope you really enjoy the rest of this absolutely wonderful evening and many, many hours of joy as you peruse through this absolutely outstanding work of art, this wonderful book. And please buy lots of copies. Mm -hmm. <laughs>